the Dhamma Sangha our refuge. And the way we access that refuge today is partly by the quieting our minds and the curiosity and exploration that we do in meditation. It's partly by engaging with the suttas. It's partly by our sila, our ethical conduct. It's partly by, or wholly by, our kalyanamita, our, our good friends in the Dhamma. So bringing all of those into this space with us, our history, our lineage, back to the Buddha. The space that we're in today, the land that we're on, the peoples who made this land a viable place for us to live, who care took the land before any of us were here on it. I don't know the tribes of this particular area of Capitol Hill, probably um, the Seattle tribe, I would guess, and others as well. And then all of the peoples who have lived here. The St. Mark's Cathedral, I think, is still part of this, this building, Skinner. No. Um, for Clare Mountain, who oh, they're on retreat elsewhere, but they make it possible for us to be here. Our parents, our ancestors. and each other. And coming from this, from this heritage, this rich heritage, we also bring our habits, <laughs> our tendencies, our cultural upbringing, our family upbringing, our dispositions. And we get to choose how we bring those together, the rich heritage and the rich habits. <laughs> and we get to see what we want to cultivate now. I was, uh, Amanda kindly gave me the ride to come join you today from the ferry. And I was saying how I don't, I'm not really preparing for these as like a Dhamma talk where I have an outline and the topics I'm going to cover. It's much more what's going to emerge. And sometimes it really looks like a mind map and sometimes it's a bunch of squiggles. Um, let's see, I was here last time and I had my not slacking off relax. So maybe I'll start with what's, I went into retreat shortly after that. There was a lovely day long um, on Bainbridge. I'll just throw it out now. We'll do another one on the 22nd of October. And post the day long, um, I wrote this one down. These are called vent diagrams. Not Venn diagrams, although they're shaped, they are Venn diagrams, they're also vent diagrams. They have this little space in the middle, uh, two things that might be um, opposites or, or contradictory, and how they create a tension, but together they create a whole. So I started working with habits, looking at habits, addictive tendencies, dispositions, and I thought, oh, I'm going to cultivate good habits and not clinging. <laughs> so this was the one I worked with throughout my retreat. Maybe I'll start there. Habit. The word, when I tried to find it in Pali, this might surprise you. What word in Pali would you 
think was for habits. Any, any poly scholars? Mm. Nope, okay. Sila. Sila. Definition number two for Sila is the one we're used to of ethics, our, um, the, our moral practices. Definition number one is our nature, our character, our habit behavior. And it has phrases like, oh, they're being, they're of such a nature. Or they have that habit. This is their sila. Found that really interesting. So habits are talked about in the, um, in the suttas a lot, the, our dispositions. Usually you'll find when the word is sila in the suttas, most of the time it's going to be talking about definition number two, specifically around the morality. And the fact that our conditioning, our nature, is what we're actually up against. <laughs> and what we want to be cultivating to be the good habits is very telling. Because when that's in alignment, when definition one and definition two are in alignment, wow. That's when we're meeting things as they are in a way that's good and wholesome. So the sutta I picked today is in the Itivutika. Um, and this, I, I, mm, I like to tell the story of where the Itivutika came from, and you can ask me afterwards if you'd like, but I'm going to just go into it today. So this is a short one, Itivutika um, 2... 30, it's 80 Vuruka 30, it's in the twos. And it says these two things are mortifying. And we'll unpack that word, mortifying. What two? It's when someone hasn't done good and skillful things that keep them safe, but has done bad, violent, and depraved things. Thinking, I haven't done good things, they're mortified. Thinking, I have done bad things, they're mortified. These are the two things that are mortifying. Mortify, that's not a word that we use a whole lot, except uh, maybe occasionally, they, oh, I'm mortified. Uh, I have used that one at odd moments. It generally just kind of means embarrassed, but in a really kind of deep way. It's an interesting word uh, in Pali, tapaniya, burning, causing remorse, mortifying. And it's that burning. When I'm, when I'm mortified, when I'm embarrassed, what happens in my body? You know, it's, it's that flush. You know, I feel hot. Maybe I, I get the, the little pricklies under the arms, you know, and uh, the, the feeling like my face is really hot. So that's, that's this sensation. Often in the suttas, you'll hear about hiriyotapa, you know, the, the using of this sense of shame or remorse in a positive way where it's like, oh, there's my little warning, going off track here. Here, I think we're getting at the same kind of thing. It's when the flush comes because um, we're, re we're recalling, I've, I haven't done something that was good. I wanted, it would have been good to do that, I didn't do it. We're thinking, I did something bad. Oh, I'm embarrassed. So I'm gonna move over to Brene Brown, one of our, our modern scholars on <laughs> these uh, afflictive and wholesome states, and how this one kind of walks the line. Now, when it goes into mortification and shame, it's not a forward leading. 
when it's that quick embarrassment, it brings us on track. So in this lovely book, Atlas of the Heart, Brene Brown says, embarrassment is a fleeting feeling of self-conscious discomfort in response to a minor incident that was witnessed by others. And this is where the Kalyana meet to come in. We really do want people to witness our little gaffes because it helps us to stay aligned and you know, recollect. This is a social thing that evolves, though. This kind, uh, the embarrassment that um, Brene Brown talks about. She wrote, last we know from the research is that embarrassment takes years to develop, and its emergence coincides with the self-conscious ability to understand what others may be thinking of us. I am curious, and I hope maybe we could bring it up, I'm curious if it's also your experience as it is mine that a lot of those thoughts that come in meditation are about what others might be thinking about me, what I did or didn't do or should or shouldn't do or might become or be or blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Okay, I'm seeing some head nods. Let's see. She goes on, if you've raised tweens or teens or even been in their vicinity, you know that they often spend more time being embarrassed or mortified than not. It's constant cringe when we find when we first start seeing ourselves through others' eyes. And it stays that way until we get to midlife and fall apart before we realize it takes just too much energy to try to manage perception. <laughs> Some chuckles on that one. It takes just too much energy to try and manage perception. For those of you below midlife, don't wait. <laughs> This construct of managing perception, it's that identity making. So one of the other notes I made was, oh, some of these notes came about literally in the middle of the night. I just put the paper in a pen next to me. I didn't turn the light on. I luckily can still read my writing. Um, I kind of vaguely had a sense of where I had written. So it's this kind of sharing. It's in the meditation we felt what was arising, not identified with it. And it's the same thing when there's that spark of oops, to feel it, oops, and then, I'm not sure where it is, um, oh, yes, here. Embarrassment does not persist for long periods of time lasting only a few minutes, and I would say if you're a practitioner, a fraction of a second maybe even, instead of hours or days. A point nicely illustrated by the unique Phyllis, oops, no, that's the blush part. Um, when we feel embarrassed, we feel exposed, flustered, and clumsy. But we tend to respond to our embarrassment in non-threatening ways, like using humor saying we're sorry, or sometimes just moving on. So this is a healthy way to use this characteristic of, ooh, that's hot, and choosing so that we don't end up as in the sutta with the, um, oh, those are good things I didn't do, and those are bad things I did do, and I'm mortified. Can we use it as a, oh, our meditations get stiller when we're able to just taste it and move on. Let's see here. Um, I had a time. Okay. Habits. 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 <laughs> 
addictions, predispositions, tendencies. Some of them wholesome, for sure. The good habits we're cultivating. Some of them have been around a very long time. Anyone here have the habit of thinking? <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> I've, I've had other habits and addictions too, but thinking, the one that's so much prevalent in our meditation practice that we against, which just stirs it up more. Well, how do we, a habit is, and it's going to keep spinning. It's been spinning for a long time. We don't get it to stop and slow down by continuing to push the habit. It just keeps winding up. With mindfulness, I'm noticing that if I'm watch the habit. I'm not judging and suppressing the habit. I'm not talking about, now when I've been in um, serious addiction, I need to do some restraining effort work. But when I'm just watching a habit that is not um, endangering me at this moment or endangering others, and I watch it, my mindfulness, it's like Putting, um, trying to think, uh, let's just say the merry-go-round in the play yard. Do they, I don't know if they still have those, but <laughs> the merry-go-round in the play yard. And you push it. Well, if you put your hand out and as it slaps against the hand, you're not grabbing it and like wrenching your shoulder out. If you put your hand down and it just kind of, that friction slows it down, it slows the habit down. And I'm thinking that's what our mindfulness is doing. It's, it's the friction that slows our habits down because we become aware of them. And so I'd like to, what I'm playing with, all, all, all of this is the exploration that's present for me now. I'm playing with mortification, momentary mortification. <laughs> Momentary mortification being that impetus for the mindfulness that helps me let slow the habit down, and then it begins to unwind. And what it unwinds into is that stillness, that safety, that spaciousness. What I'm noticing is by just giving it that attention, as it's so like that, that um, Oh, probably a terrible analogy, but I, I, I've seen pictures of those roulette balls. <laughs> the, 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 and of the little thing that, as it, the, and so it, that's, it slows it down. I guess the game would probably go on a long time if they didn't have that. <laughs> that game's called Samsara. <laughs> so one thing I'm going to bring in, and then let's open it up, is how do we meet this? How do we do the attention and the slowing down so that we're holding a habit in such a way that we can see it and it can unwind? And there are times where you see it and it's like, poof, not doing that anymore. And there are some occasions where that is so strong, it's done. And there are occasions where you think it's so strong that it's done, and it's not. It comes around again. But you did slow it down a little bit. So there's another section in here where Brene Brown cites um, Kristen Neff, who's also a, a fantastic scholar and practitioner around... Um, uh, understanding compassion, self-compassion in particular, and that it has three elements. And I'll name the three, but then we'll focus on the mindfulness one. The three are self-kindness, common humanity, it's not just me, and mindfulness. And so I'm talking about the mindfulness aspect, but please, there's a... 
like a questionnaire online. You can go get your self-compassion score. Don't beat yourself up when you get it, please. <laughs> So, um, and it's at, I, I think it's selfcompassion.com. Um, you can ask me afterwards if we can look it up in here. Um, so the mindfulness, I just wanted to read the definition here. Mindfulness is a non-judgmental, receptive mind state in which one observes thoughts and feelings as they are without trying to suppress or deny them. We cannot ignore our pain and feel compassion for it at the same time. At the same time, mindfulness requires that we not be over-identified with thoughts and feelings so that we are caught up and swept away by negativities, by negative reactions. Yeah, and then she does give the, it, it's, self-compassion.org is where this, this survey is. And I think that the uh, characteristics that she calls out in, in that survey of, you know, are we being kind to ourselves or are we being judgmental? Are we looking at the common humanity of the, of the lived experience or are we isolating? Are we being mindful or are we, this, the, the opposite she gives, over-identification. I thought that was brilliant. The opposite of, my, of, of mindfulness is not dissociated or unattentive. She's pairing it with over-identification, the getting sticky with. So I'd like to open it up and see if either from our meditation or this discussion or anything else, you know, we've got a fairly small group that we can go into. What does this feel like? What are you feeling now? Did anything shift? Have you seen something from these words, how they impact and what you might do with it? How might you play with this? So please. Let's open it up. And we, we do have one person online. You're also welcome to, to share in this exploration. Sadhu, 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 anu. A roving mic. Who's got a hand to? Okay, great. Just because I'm not shy. Um, I thank you for for your talk and also for looping in Brene Brown. I love that book, um, especially the last chapter. I, I don't know. We should talk about it. Um, but I I've been thinking a lot about that feeling of mortification as um, related to comma, like mm -hmm. as something that's kind of. There's a nagging feeling of, of embarrassment that's quick and is observational, but that is also trying to say, like, you know, they're out of line. I was just wondering, is that does that track with you, or am I? Yeah. So I'm hearing maybe that it's it's alerting you of of an alignment issue. Yes. Yeah, I think that's that's a really good way to put it, um, and. I don't know, what if we carry the analogy a little further? The, when we're aware of it being out of alignment, it, it's bumping up. Okay, the dukkha is, is meaning, is actually literally a word for a wheel that's out of alignment, the hub of the wheel that's out of alignment. Um, and the friction that's there. So if we can attend to it with mindfulness and not with identification, you know, it's the unfolding of comma, and now it has consequences. We're just aware of the, the circumstances of being human or being a being. Then we don't get um, road rash. <laughs> but 
if I keep the application of, oh, I'm mortified, I'm so bad, I'm so embarrassed, well, this is awful, I'm a dreadful being, I can't believe that, I've got a pretty bad rash developing. And that, I would say, is going erring into the unwholesome. Whereas that initial awareness, I'm out of alignment. And just without identification, I'm out of alignment. What might I want to do about that? Is that? Okay. All right. Anyone want to take that analogy further or pull in another one? Okay, wait for the mic so that the, we can hear online. We've got a question about embarrassment. Yeah, so the question is, uh, we know some, some animals probably oh, don't place have it. it. Most of the animals probably don't have it, like maybe cats and dogs, sometimes they kind of have a feeling they did something wrong. Uh, some humans do have it, uh, not always, sometimes. And then, so the question would be, how about, uh, so we have, Animal kingdom, human kingdom. Can you hold it? I, I can hear you almost. Okay. So the animals um, typically some, don't, and then you said some humans, and now continue. Some, some humans sometimes have, sometimes don't. Yeah. So, so we have animal kingdom, we have human kingdom, and then how about these beings that would be kind of like Buddhas, or those that are about to become the Buddhas, um, which is next um, kingdom? Do they have a sense of embarrassment? And what I would just want to get your idea. What do you think about these things? Um, I'm going to maybe phrase your question slightly differently and see if it's still on. Because uh, when you're, you're saying Buddhas are about to be Buddhas, that can be in any, you know, the human realm or up. Typically, not. it's not going to be in the animal realm. Although, no, the Buddha's previous life, he was human. Uh, to his final, um, to, to, before his last life, um, to being the Deva realms. Um, oh, right, right. So, so this, the question is, embarrassment, does it typically only for in the human kingdom? Since we know that animals probably don't have it. Right. Uh, or, and then when, let's say, beings transitioned into the next um, uh, kingdom, is there such a thing as embarrassment on that level? I would say yes, and I open this up. And the reason I say, or at least something equivalent, uh, maybe, shall I say, chagrin, maybe is still in that category, the family of embarrassment, of mortification. So there was the time that, um, um, I, th I think it was Saka, the king of the gods, was got a fantastic discourse from the Buddha, and he went back up to the palaces and the heavenly realm. And I think it was Mogalana who visited him because he wanted to say, oh, so how's, how's the practice going after that, you know, fantastic teaching? And Sakya is like, oh, well, come look at my palaces and look at my collection of nymphs and their wonderful rooms <laughs> all of this. Uh, you know, I've, I've had so much time, busyness with building my palace that I really haven't been like following up on that practice. And Mogalana shook the, the palace with his toe. And that was something then that this god, a high level of god, could go, oh, right. And I can imagine this god Sakya blushing with a little bit of chagrin that Mogalana's called him out on his priorities. So yes, uh, there are times um, that there, the, the devas, particularly when they've been interacting with the Buddha, will, will show signs of embarrassment. Um, and I do think that when we're looking at Brene Brown's research of it also being a social, socially emerging condition is important. So this is where the quality of your friends matter. The ones where you can feel that little bit of burn with, 
I have um, an, another uh, bhikkhuni who we're doing the exercise of, um, I, I'd said, I've, I kind of go down the rabbit hole. You know, on the internet, I'll go down the rabbit hole. And it's not the activity that, it's, it's not a habit that is healthy leading from my monastic life in general. And so I own that. I, I, I'm, I'm like, oh, and I'll acknowledge it. And so that cue can be something that is a social construct that helps me to acknowledge it. Then what I've, I'll just pull this in. I, I might be veering here, but um, then what I'm doing is I noticed the other day, I, there's this math game website. <laughs> math puzzles. <laughs> and I can get my hit <laughs> by going and now uh, vegging out with a puzzle. I watched the other day when I was feeling that I doesn't feel I, I, I want to distract from this. I watched opening the website. I noticed, and this is, so I'm checking this pattern. I took a breath. I took a breath. I was already feeling better. I haven't even gotten to see my puzzle yet. <laughs> but I was feeling better. And then I didn't open the puzzle. I closed the web browser, I closed my eyes, and I went inside. It's like I got my hit without the damage. <laughs> so having the companions where I can then say, no, I was lost in my la-la land, whatever one it was, or I was able to taste it and, and see what the gratification was for going there and turn to a more wholesome means of meeting that. So I veered a bit from where you're going, do you want to bring back in or do others want to answer about because I'm not knowledgeable about all of the realms and what can be experienced there. Anyone have more information on this? I was just wondering if um, in this school of Buddhism, do they study those subjects, those realms, or are there like books, like serious work done by someone or, or in the past? Yes. Um, it's not necessary, but it can be a valuable part of practice to visit those realms. It isn't something I've done, so I can't speak about it. Uh, to visit those realms and see what the, to sense, to feel what it is to be in those realms and what are the characteristics um, arising, passing, all of the, that the characteristics apply there too. Um, so it can be beneficial to, through meditation practice, have the mind be subtle enough to be able to visit those realms and experience them. Um, and I'm, have not read it, I've only glossed it, but I, it seems a very good source is Ajahn Punadamo's book on Buddhist cosmology. I think will give you a lot more information about the realms. And one of these days I will pick it up, but um, it's not near the top on my reading list right now. So I would definitely recommend, uh, I've heard lots of good things and what I looked at, that's a good place to start. Also, the Chronicles of the Buddha can be very interesting. Uh, it, it goes through past Buddhas, not just Shakyamuni Buddha's uh, experiences in lives. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. 
sorry if I ramble a little bit. I haven't fully thought this through, but um, I've been reading a book called Uncommon Wisdom. I forgot the author. It's Ajahn Pan. I don't remember. <laughs> um, but more so than that, I've been thinking about like the ideas of Panya, like wisdom and like the development of right view. And I wanted to get more your thoughts on that. Um, like I had a realization that I don't think like you can typically control the views that you hold. It's like the views that you hold, the beliefs that you have are just based on the experiences that you've lived so far and the evidence you've gathered to like solidify a view. So it's like once you have a view, it's like to hold it lightly, to not have an attachment to it allows you to change that view. Um, and that requires like mindfulness of the experiences you're having so that you can eventually change it. But it also means like for the views that you do have, you didn't really choose to like develop it. They just came to be as you like lived, <laughs> lived through life and like gathered through experiences. Oh, oh yeah, this, this feels correct because like having, holding this view kind of like leads me to live a better life or whatever. Um, and thinking on that, I was like, okay, if you don't control your views and, um, you need experience to like develop wisdom and like, you need to experience different views to like develop right view. Would it be like a good practice to like experiment with like holding views and like trying to track <laughs> your level of suffering or like what is, what is your practice of trying to iterate on the views that you do hold? Awesome ramble. <laughs> Awesome ramble. Uh, and, and in my view, so aligned with, with this, this practice. Um, so the developing, uh, uh, the topic, one of the topics I had going around my little doodles uh, was looking at certainty. And I actually feel like looking at certainty and humility comes before the talking about we're starting to get into safety today, but I haven't played enough yet, so maybe some other some other time. Certainty, though, when so the Buddha doesn't say don't have a view. It's samaditi. It's it's an aligned. I like using aligned for sama, aligned view, uh, a, a liberating view. And in the Metta Sutta, it, it says not, one translation is fixed views, one's false views. Uh, I kind of think that they go together a little bit there, the fixed and the false. It's a matter of when we hold a view with mindfulness, we can taste what it feels like to hold that view. Not just the content, but the holding. So what does the grip on that view feel like? It's my view, and it's right. <laughs> Feels very different than, yeah, I kind of have a notion that this is so. By this experience, I'm curious. Very different feeling in the body. Very different opening for possibility and exploration and growth. So both what view am I holding and how does it impact me? And even more so, how am I holding and what does it feel like? And also look at the impact. When I have this view and express it, when I express it part, you also have the whole flavoring of how are you embodied at that moment. So that's your whole body language and tone and all that, isn't there? But if, if let's just say you wrote it down and they read it hours after it, the paper had off-gassed from whatever you've been feeling. Um, if you If you fix that view and put it out there. Look at the impact of that view on others. Is it wholesome? Is it healthy? Is it liberating? 
So that's where the content aspect of it begins to matter. And that's where the sila in both definitions, my ethics, my morals, how I'm acting in the world, and my disposition, my habits, my energies, my comma, unfolding, matter. Uh, so, yeah, how are, you, how are you engaging in this exploration? What is your methodology? Um, mine is mostly like journaling. Um, journaling about the views that I hold, and then I, the reflection is reading back previous entries as I go back, I've been like journaling for years, so it's pretty easy to see how much I've changed or my life has changed. And then I write about like the current views I hold, or, like my understanding of morality, my understanding of like what it means, like what actions I should take to develop happiness. And then progress is like how fulfilled and how satisfied, how content, how happy I am right now. And then I iterate based on like the stuff I read, the stuff I think about. I think um, the hardest part is like holding the mindfulness um, when other people express their views that I don't agree with at the moment. Because like, I think for me, it's like to understand, you need to stand under, you need to have humility to like try to like hold their view while not like hold their view to see how they expressed it and then to see if it actually works and then like the hardest part is changing like the things that I feel like concretely do make my life better but maybe is not like the optimal way to do it if that makes sense very much so um I, I didn't bring my my notes on the certainty and uh Humility was the other word that we that I was exploring, uh, and this this exploration came out of I was I was reading a book um, that Paul Linden, an Aikido master who does peace building, peacemaking exercises, uh, and then he was doing an online class, and we were exploring the word certainty and humility, and the, the definitions, the body definition that we have of those words. What does it feel like? So it sounds like that's coming out in your journaling, is what is it to have a certainty, and what kind of certainty is it? And is there a humility around it that there's space for others to have views that I can be curious about and not uptight about or tight about? I'm curious if others have other modalities they use to do this kind of uh, first, the, the, this right view uh, the first of the Eightfold Path exploration, uh, or to go off on the definitions of certainty and humility, or anywhere else you want to go. <laughs> it's a little um, divergent, but thank you for that question, Samak. It was really good in the answer. Um, I've been struggling to hold compassion and mindfulness when I don't feel safe. So that was what came up for me. And the content of it is, in a nutshell, a couple of acts, ill will towards, not, not personal, but towards my husband and I that, again, not personal, some thefts, um, theft of items. And I've let go of the attachment to the items, but I'm over identifying with this feeling of not being safe. Um, and initially in the first theft, I felt a lot of compassion for the burglars and felt like, oh, like what is that like to be in that space where this feels like a good act, you know? But now that it's happened again, there's this, anger and it's really become a hindrance i'm i'm over identifying it with it and all these other experiences of anger from my childhood are now all of a sudden like popping up and i wonder if you have any recommendations for a skillful practice for mindfulness and compassion when anger arises especially when you don't feel safe 
Sorry to throw you such a doozy. <laughs> it's a great doozy. One of the things I hadn't really brought up was the value of being safe enough. Oh, we, we touched on it a little bit in the, in the guided meditation about, you know, looking around the space, the people we're with at this moment, the conditions we have right now, safe enough to be vulnerable and open and uh, curious. I have, uh, and I want to thank all of you for being part of it. This Vasa, this three-month period I've got right now, I feel so safe. I feel so um, free to explore where it's tight, to explore my habits, to see my habits, to be honest about my habits. <laughs> I feel so safe to be able to let things unfold and be curious because at least for this three month period, the likelihood of uh, my well-being being violated is pretty small. And that has given me a lot of freedom to attend to the practice. So I was musing in a group last week about social justice and about um, that sense of safety and how having it, having that sense of safety made it possible for me to show up and acknowledge and be with and explore and be a better person. It helps me to have the space to notice my history with anger or with uh, self-belittlement or with, you, you know, pick yours, um, you know, doubting, uh, fear, so many things. It, it makes it possible. What if we could have that gift for everyone? What if there were safety in the world that it was safe to explore ethics. It was safe to explore holding the precepts because we didn't feel the need to violate them, to take someone else's property or to harm them or speak against them because we had enough. So it's a little tangential but it's a start into how to work into this space. Safety matters. And it's a gift. When we are practicing the precepts, we're giving that gift to everyone around us. We're safe to be around. So you've experienced twice someone breaking the precepts and the impact that has on your well-being. Eventually, as the Mangala Sutta says, we get to a space where every, every place is safe. That doesn't mean theft doesn't happen. It means that our hearts are not moved out of the vector of compassion because our practice is so stable and so assured and we are not identified with. You noted several really important factors there where you could have the sense of compassion and then when it became, oh, here it is with me again, this is not right, this is not safe. That coming into it, um, it changes the flavor. It changes the flavor of it. And it moves us off that stable, safe refuge. So one thing is to do the internal aspect of where have I not felt safe? 
This is touching that raw space over lifetimes. Because this world's messed up. It's messed up. And it's been messed up for a long time. And we're not fixing it. We can build more spaces of safety and compassion and goodness and enoughness for more people and for ourselves. But we're not fixing it. So I wonder if that's enough to 